from the book that Ollie mentioned in my introduction. It was such a dream for me to create the cover art for that book. And I can only hope that the cover art does justice to the incredible stories told by the book's authors, one of whom is here with us today. To lead us through our journey through the dawn of the Disney World, please welcome author and Disney Imagineer, Stephen Vignini. Hello, D23. Thank you, Fabiola. How is everyone today? Oh, fantastic. So good to see everyone. Uh, D23 is sort of my home. I've been part of Destination D now, I think, 10 years ago was our first one here in Central Florida. Who was at that Destination D back in 2011? By a show of hands. Fantastic. Well, welcome back. Everyone whose first Destination D it is, raise your hand. Oh my gosh, incredible. I, I know Michael Vargo asked you that yesterday, but I had to see it for myself from the stage. So amazing. Well, as Fabiola mentioned, my name is Stephen Vagnini. I am with Walt Disney Imagineering, formerly from the teams at the Walt Disney Archives and D23. And this morning, I am so thrilled to present a look back at the development and early years of the Walt Disney World Resort. Our program today will have three segments, and we're gonna begin with a look back um, through the development of the property through the lens of our coffee table book, our new release from Disney Editions, A Portrait of Walt Disney World, 50 Years of the Most Magical Place on Earth. It was an incredible opportunity to chronicle the history of Walt Disney World, look at its influence on the world at large. And in our program today, we're gonna to jump around and hopefully make some new discoveries together, look at a variety of different eras and subjects, and hopefully you'll all find some of your special memories reflected here as well. Uh, much of what we'll show also ended up on the cutting room floor, it didn't make it into the final book, so we hope you enjoy that also. I couldn't do any of this without my two incredible co-authors, um, who unfortunately can't be with me today, but will appear virtually. We have Kevin Kern, manager of research of the Walt Disney Archives, and Disney author and historian, Tim O'Day. We uh, collaborated on this book for a few years together, really brought a lot of different perspectives. I think we learned a lot, gained a lot in the process, though I wish I gained a little bit of Tim's hair um, throughout, but wasn't so lucky. However, we did draw upon our personal recollections and memories of Walt Disney World, things that I think all of us harbor. Tapping into, of course, favorite memories, whether it's hugging an irascible duck or hanging out with the Sherman brothers if you're Tim O'Day and there's Dick and Elizabeth right there. Um, and that's my brother and my, myself there on the right. Um, actually, we were bounding as Dick Nunes in his Bermuda shorts, if you remember Becky's presentation yesterday. In any case, uh, we were also influenced by the many great Walt Disney World books that came before us. Books like Jeff Curdy's Since the World Began from the 25th anniversary. Um, these are just incredible volumes that speak to the legacy of our resort. Now we're a quarter century later, looking back across five decades plus, and we decided to not look chronologically at the history of our resort, but rather thematically through the lens of our thematic compass. So all the stories of Walt Disney World, past, present, even a little bit of the future, we tell through the lens of nostalgia, discovery, fantasy, and tomorrow. So we hope you enjoy that um, if you have a chance to pick up the book. Now, we also begin our book a little bit unconventionally, and I want to start our presentation off that way as well, because we begin our story about Disney World long before there ever was a Disney World. In fact, we go back to the Disney family's roots in the Sunshine State that go far, far earlier, because decades before those first Disney Land Rovers ever traversed the site here, long before Walt and Roy ever thought about Central Florida for their new enterprise, there was an earlier generation of Disney's and the Disney family that identified Central Florida as their dream. In fact, it was Walt's grandparents and parents who was settled here in 1884 with their five youngest children and escaped the cold, harsh winters of Ellis, Kansas. Here we have Charles and Henrietta Call, Walt's maternal grandparents, who settled near a small town named Kismet. Kismet is not a place you can find on the map today. It's, it's long been a, sort of a lost town of Florida, but it is a name that means destiny, which I think is just so poetic. Now here is one of their five children, Flora Call on the left. 
You'll see her right there joined by Elias Disney, who joined her here in Florida from Kansas. The two ended up getting married right here in the Sunshine State. They would run a number of businesses together, including managing a hotel on the coast. They even raised a citrus grove here. Um, one year, though, there was a terrible freeze. Their citrus crop died out. They ended up moving to the Midwest, where the other Disney children would be born, uh, their first of which, Herb Disney, was born here in Florida, by the way. Um, but it's interesting that that freeze kind of sent them away, partially. Um, incidentally, a few years later, another major freeze would impact the town of Kismet. And, of course, the economy went down, everyone moved to nearby settlements. But, fast forward decades later to the 1960s, there's another citrus freeze that impacts the value of the land in Florida, might make Florida a little ripe as terms of a potential place for two Disney brothers of a later generation to pick the Sunshine State for their dream of Walt Disney World. So a citrus freeze sent us out, a citrus freeze sorta kinda brought us back. We thought that was a little poetic as well. But we are so thankful to the gentleman right here on screen, Disney legend, Walt Disney Archives founder, Dave Smith. It is thanks to Dave that we know so much We know so much about the Disney family thanks to his incredible work. And he's pictured here at a local cemetery where Charles and Henrietta Call were laid to rest. Uh, Kevin and I made a trip later to that site in January of 2020 to take a look at the place where the Disney settled. And it is remarkable how closely that landscape that was owned by Elias and the Call family at the time resembles the pine forests that would later attract Walt and Roy just 50 miles due south so many years later. So that's just one little snapshot from our opening chapter, but what we really wanted to do throughout this book was create little historical snapshots, capturing as many voices as possible, including some essays from some Disney notables. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to my co-author, Tim, to share a little bit more. Hi, Stephen. I hope you're enjoying this subtle plug for our book. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I'm going to highlight for you some other sections of the book, uh, one of the essays, and I think a sweet little nod to some beloved cast members. So let's take a look. We were very fortunate to have a contribution by Roy Patrick Disney, representing three generations of Disneys. Now, starting here, you can see his grandfather. I love that portrait, that kind of official portrait of Roy because rarely do you see him laughing that heartily in a photograph. We also felt it was necessary to highlight a few cast members that live on in the memories of guests, such as these two. I'm sure many of you through the years received a hearty welcome to the grand and a tip of the hat from Richard Girth, the charming greeter at Disney's Grand Floridian Resort. And how many of you received hula lessons or a flowery lay from Auntie Cowie? We're so glad we could add their smiles to this book. Thank you, Tim. We are so honored to feature the voices of so many cast members, Imagineers, leaders, um, and even guests in our book. And in fact, we've interviewed close to about 100 people to paint this portrait of Walt Disney World. Among some of those people were some of the very first individuals ever associated with Walt Disney's Project X, the top secret Project Florida. And some of those names we do honor on our Main Street windows, as you'll see here. This window you'll find on Center Street, here in the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World, in the pseudonym Real Estate Development Company. Let's talk about some of the names that we see here. And I want to point out two specifically, Bob Price and Bob Foster. Well, it turns out that these two individuals were the same person, because Bob Price Foster was the mastermind behind the entire acquisition of the 27 square miles, 27,000 square miles that we're standing on right now. Um, it was Walt and Roy who charged him to acquire somewhere between 5,000, 10,000 acres. That should be enough, right? Of course, we went far more than that. But Bob had to take so many different extra measures to make sure that his identity was protected, that he wasn't traced back to Walt Disney Productions for a variety of reasons. And one of those tactics, tactics, of course, was calling himself Bob Price, his first and middle name, to locals to not be traced back to Disney. Now, he was also responsible for Central Florida being the nation's top rumor mill in the 1960s, as thousands of acres of land were mysteriously trading hands on the Orange and Osceola County borders. And the media and, of course, the public were baffled as to all this acreage uh, that was being bought up by some mystery industry. Kevin and Tim and I are so grateful to Bob for giving us the chance to interview him over the course of the past decade on several occasions, and many of his favorite recollections are included in the book, and I'd love to share a couple of them with you today because I think they're just 
as astonishing, really. Some of those stories actually echo off another Main Street window. This is a right above the Crystal Art Shop on Main Street, USA. And on the right, you'll see the name of several subsidiaries that Bob created to hold the title to the mounting land purchases to acquire all of Walt Disney World. Now, these first five ones um, we'll talk about here, actually, bit by bit, because they essentially encompass those 43 square miles we're talking about, and every parcel tells a story. So let's take a little look here. We have I-4, we have 530. You know, I always wanted to be a meteorologist when I was growing up because I thought it'd be cool to like point at maps and do that kind of thing. So thanks for bearing with me. In any case, let's talk about Reedy Creek Ranch Lands because this was the company that acquired 12,500 acres, which is currently home to the four Walt Disney World theme parks that we know today. And it was filled with majestic wilderness and Walt really had his eyes set on that massive part of property. But based on the information that Bob Foster reviewed, this property would be an absolute nightmare to acquire because he noticed there were these little small plots that all seemed to have different owners. Well, upon further research, Bob finds out that in the turn of the century, a gentleman by the name of Willis Munger had subdivided the area and sold off these five acre lots through a massive mail order operation. So all across the US, people had their little slice of Florida paradise or so they thought. A lot of this land was in the middle of an inaccessible swamp that they could not point to on a map, that they couldn't, um, certainly had not visited before. And you could imagine Bob really wanted to avoid this area. But there was just one problem. This was the land that Walt Disney totally fell in love with on reconnaissance flights over the property. He looked out on that lake and that island and said, that's going to be my Tom Sawyer Island. Of course, our Tom Sawyer Island ended up in the Magic Kingdom, but it was now Bob's job to negotiate to get this island and the lake as well. The island itself has a remarkable history. As Fabiola told you, it was called Riles Island for quite a while, and in the 1930s was owned by this gentleman, a Central Florida radio disc jockey and Orlando City Commissioner, Radio Nick. Uh, Delmar Radio Nick Nicholson, I guess I should say. Um, and he lived on the island with his wife, with their sandhill crane. He was a reptile enthusiast. He studied reptiles. Um, he also raised rare tropical fruits um, on his island. Um, and we thought that was quite fun as well. He would eventually sell the island to a group of different couples, 13 couples who owned the island. And uh, now Bob had to negotiate with 13 husbands and 13 wives to acquire Bay Lake and the island that they used for vacation purposes. But they did so through Bay Lake Properties, that second company. Now, of course, that was more than enough land that then Walt and Roy initially asked Bob to acquire, but they couldn't resist themselves when another 7,500 acres uh, seemed to be available just to the south. And this was pasture land and swamp owned by the gentleman here in the Cattleman Hat. Uh, that is the former state senator, Erlo Bronson, very prominent here in central Florida. He used it for his cattle ranching operation. Now, he agreed to sell the land to Bob Foster, but there was just one problem. He dealt only on handshakes. You can imagine that was a little bit difficult for Bob to explain to the folks back in California. But after several tours of the Reedy Creek Swamp, um, the senator, along with his herding dog named Homer, who I heard was less than cordial to Bob Foster, the all three finally shook on it, and eventually we acquired the property as well. Something I found totally fascinating about this, at one point the senator was planning to sell a portion of his land to a local vet who was planning to open a facility for animal research. Uh, that never happened, but just a few miles from that site, several decades later, we would open Disney's Animal Kingdom and Rafiki's Planet Watch, which in my view is one of the world's premier centers of animal care and conservation awareness. So it really does come full circle. So within about six months, Bob's really able to acquire a lot of land for Walt and Roy. Is that enough for Walt? Probably not. Walt always wanted to plus things. And on one meeting during a status review, Walt approaches the map of Florida, he waves his arm over this 2,500 acre tract just to the east, and he says, this is where we could do a development of a conventional nature. Now with those words, I think Bob's heart sank because that was the heart of the dreaded Munger subdivision. All those five by five acre plots that were sold off on mail order, this was filled with them. At this point, just six months into the program, Bob Foster had to extend his project an entire year just to get this acreage. And he had to go all across the country to negotiate with landowners. One of his favorite stories negotiating with one of them took place in the Appalachian Mountains of Tennessee, where he met the owner of one of those lots at seven in the morning, and by nine o'clock he had sampled his host's wild cherry wine with a generous portion of upside down cake, was treated to a self-taught session of banjo, and shared his pride in the ownership of, quote, the best darn mule in all Tennessee. 
And by the time Bob left, he got that land, right? Wrong. The owner decided to instead sell it, or actually trade it for a cultivator and another mule instead. So it did not become part of our Walt Disney World property. However, we did form two other organizations, including the I-4 Corporation with the interstate going right through it, to eventually lead to the homes of Lake Buena Vista and Disney Springs. So those five companies on that Main Street window, they were all owned by one entity called the Compass East Corporation, which later was known as the Walt Disney World Company. And now it was time for Walt and his Imagineers to begin to plot out all the ideas and plans they could possibly imagine, 27,443 acres. But as Disney legend Joe Potter said it, if Walt had, his, his, had it his way, he would have asked for 50,000 acres. But thanks to Walt and Roy, and especially Bob Foster, we're all standing here today at Walt Disney World in Central Florida. And just this year, Bob celebrated his 97th birthday. Big round of applause for Bob. And as part of that, he got a special honor by Bob Weiss, president of creative and new experience development for Walt Disney Imagineering, along with Disney legend Wing Chow and so many others in and outside the company. And just recently, Kent Ramsey brought back some 50th anniversary swag, a good friend of Bob's, and shared a little video uh, of Bob to share with us. So here's Bob Foster. Happy birthday, Walt Disney World. <laughs> One more round of applause for legendary Bob Foster. <laughs> well, in addition to these incredible stories, at least as authors, we found them pretty incredible, we also wanted to fill our book with amazing photos and images that hopefully our readers hadn't seen as much before. So with that, couldn't be done without the incredible partners at the Imagineering Slide and Art Libraries, the Yellow Shoes Resource Center. I would like to turn it over to Tim now to tell us a little bit about some of our favorite images in the book. So over to you, Tim. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back, everyone. In this next segment, we want to highlight some of the great and terrific concept art sprinkled throughout the chapters and two of our favorite spreads. So if you're ready to go, let's dissolve and take a look. Our first image is by Imagineer Joe Warren, who captures the excitement of Disney's boardwalk in this stunning 1998 depiction. It perfectly reflects the 1920s fantasy and fun of boardwalks of a bygone era. One of my favorite places at Walt Disney World is Liberty Square, and maybe that's why I love this image by Disney Imagineer Leo Svensson. This was done in about 1968. This is from the Central Plaza and across the bridge looking over into Liberty Square. The backstage utilidors ensure the smooth operation of the Magic Kingdom upstairs. This particular layout is actually a first and very historic. Take a good look. It contains more polyester per square inch than any other book or magazine layout in history. And of course, we would be remiss if our book didn't contain a salute to the very beloved Carousel of Progress. I'm sure we have more than just a few Carousel of Progress fans in the audience. If we didn't include this attraction in the book, we know all of you would ensure all of our tomorrows would not be big and they would not be beautiful. Oh, I love it. Thank you, Tim. Now, in our research, we just made some incredible findings, these little tidbits of information that we just had to sprinkle throughout, and I brought a couple of them to share with you today, such as the name Walt Disney World. Long before we named it that, long before even the name Disney World was considered, there were a few other names. Uh, we found this in a memo back dating to 1964. Walt Disney's Vacation Land, Disney Rama, Disney Worlds, even Walt Disney's Wonder Worlds were considered. These were just different ideas to uh, really illustrate that this would be a massive vacation recreation destination enterprise, um, as opposed to the original Disneyland in Anaheim. Of course, we settled on the Disney World name, and Roy Disney plussed it himself by adding the name Walt to it, so he always knew it would be his younger brother's greatest dream. With that said, I love these logos that were done around 1967 that kind of show the evolution of kind of that initial uh, iconography for our resort. A couple of my favorites include this weather vane here, where you see the E for East sharing the E with Disney and the, the W there with World, right? And I also love the one here with the, uh, the classic um, Mickey globe in the letter D. We start to see the genesis of what our eventual Walt Disney World logo would be in opening year. And I think many of you out there are wearing some of this merchandise with this logo. So 
nice fashion sense. All right, digging deeper into the archives collections, Kevin Kern came across some incredible finds, and among them, some great ephemera and even some pretty cool park tickets that we thought that you might get a kick out of. So let's turn it over to you, Kevin. Hi, everybody. My name is Kevin Kern. I'm the manager of research for the Walt Disney Archives, and I am so excited to be here uh, to chat a little bit more about the behind the scenes making of both our book and the development of Walt Disney World. Because of the foresight of our founder, Disney legend Dave Smith, we have an amazing historical record of ephemera in our collection that documents and maps and showcases the opening of Walt Disney World, that entire preview month from October 1st, 71, through the end of the month. Uh, so some of the material that ended up in the book highlights this. Now, one ticket that really just made our hearts sing when we found it was an example of uh, a preview month ticket, a special admission ticket from October 1st, 1971. And the back of the ticket also has a nice, lovely little greeting from Roy uh, with his signature. Now, all through preview month, there were specialty days uh, for different groups, uh, including things like there was a dedicated day for press. The press pass went with that. And Florida citrus growers, if you're an Orange Bird fan, the Florida citrus growers also had their own dedicated day uh, in early October. Digging a little bit deeper into the collection, we also found some of the earliest examples of individual or standalone tickets both to the Magic Kingdom and for transportation around the resort. And there was also specialty tickets from early on as well. Things like the Walt Disney World Open, that, that early initial golf classic, the colors and the tickets uh, that were issued for those were also used as bag tags for golf clubs. Other things that are usually tossed, right, thrown away, early parking tickets or car passes, and even an early pre-Disney dollars version of, uh, of the currency, this being a recreation coupon uh, for Walt Disney World. Uh, and includes Roy Disney's signature. How, how fun is that? Thank you so much, Kevin. And a big shout out. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin spent so much time digging through the collections of the archives. Also, the same with our Walt Disney Archives photo library team, who were able to share some great photos with us, including these great shots of Walt Disney on property, setting foot here for the very first time. His first visit on site was in November of 1965, after the land had actually been acquired, on the morning after a big press conference in downtown Orlando. And we'd seen some of these photos before, but not all of them. I love some of these photos of Walt getting to explore that beautiful lake right outside here that uh, he glimpsed only from the airplane previously. And here's some other great shots as well, exploring the, the vastness of this land. Um, and it's just incredible to think that he would only visit the site, to our knowledge, once more in May of 1966. Uh, because as we know, very sadly, Walt Disney World would open without Walt Disney. But few may realize that when he passed away in, in December of 1966, very little creative work had actually been done on the first phase of Walt Disney World, which included, of course, the Magic Kingdom. And it would be up to his creative heirs at Imagineering to determine what exactly that park would be like. Um, they didn't have a name for it yet. It was just the Florida theme park. But these notes from February of 1967 represent some of the very first concepts ever put on paper to outline the Magic Kingdom that we know and love today, giving insight into the thought process. And um, this, is, of course, is the handwriting of a young Disney legend, Marty Sklar. As you look at Marty's notes here that were quick, taken pretty quickly during this meeting, I love the Fantasyland page here. He says, what kind of castle? Obviously, Cinderella was the first one that was brought up in the meeting, so clearly that stuck. Uh, also, look at Main Street USA. You can see that a Liberty Street is mentioned with the Hall of Presidents, a carryover from a decade ago when it was thought of for Disneyland originally. But now, in the late 60s, we finally had the technology to bring that to life. We were also concerned about making sure that this park would be well-suited for Florida and its unique climate. So you could take a look at the top right for food, not as much outdoor eating as Disneyland, perhaps. They clearly were doing their research about weather patterns in Central Florida. Now, there's one more fun little discovery that we did um, in some terms of our research that I want to share with you. Um, big kudos to Kevin on this one. I'd like to turn it back over to you, Kevin, to share this treasure with the audience. Probably the, the one thing that we found while researching is that there was one piece that we have in the archives that tells an absolutely remarkable story, and it's on this page right here. It's that inconspicuous American flag that you see. Now, here's a great shot from Dedication Day, 102571, of that flag waving proudly over the Magic Kingdom. You might not know, this flag has quite the remarkable American history. This flag was a gift to Roy O. Disney from then President of the United States, Richard Nixon. And while he couldn't be there for, for the dedication ceremony, 
he made sure that he shared some token of appreciation with Roy on behalf uh, of the White House. So the other equally remarkable thing about this flag we found is that it was flown over the White House on October 1st, being opening day, came down from Washington, D.C., was, was bestowed or given to Roy, and then was flown above Main Street on October 25th. So it was used in the White House, which I just can't get over how amazing that is, and then it's flown over Main Street, connecting the two places forever. It showcases as well the importance of Walt Disney World as a global and cultural site. One of the memos we found was from Emil Curie, longtime designer for the Disney Studios, to Dave, turning the flag over, highlighting you know that this is the first time that a U.S. president has ever given away an American flag that flew over the White House, something that's truly unique for the collection. Pretty incredible. And if you head over today to the Hall of Presidents Rotunda Gallery, you will find that flag has made a happy homecoming here to the Magic Kingdom after 50 years. Thanks to Kevin's research, to Walt Disney Ar Archives director Becky Klein, who brought that flag with her by October 1st to have it displayed there in partnership with the Walt Disney Imagineering Collections team. We hope you can go check this out, as well as a couple correspondence letters between Roy O. Disney and President Nixon that flank the flag. You'll learn more about this in a presentation this afternoon with the collections team at Imagineering, so we hope you stick around for that. Well, this about wraps up our first segment of our program, looking at the making of our book. We're now gonna explore a little bit more about the dawn of the Disney world. But first, we do have a special giveaway for, I believe, five lucky audience recipients. Uh, if you're interested in a copy of our book, we do have a copy for each of you today as I read off your names. And you can go claim your prize at the guest services location, um, which has been the same location for the other great surprises and light moments throughout the weekend. So, can I have a drum roll from the audience? Fantastic, here we go. Fantastic, oh, this is lovely stationery. I might keep this. All right, the first name, Gary Johnson. We have Gary. Oh my goodness, congratulations, Gary. And my apologies in advance if I mess up any names, so please pardon me. Okay, here we go, next one, Jaden Meyerson. All right. Next, we have Cindy Zek. You get a copy of the book. All right, it is so hard to see here, but I'm sure you're out there. All right, and then we have Ubi Hernandez. All right. And then last, but certainly not least, we have Robert Mack. Robert, are you out there? All right, right over here. Fantastic. Well, congratulations, and from what I understand, copies of the book are currently available, at least they were about an hour ago, upstairs at Mickey's of Glendale, and we'll be doing a signing. Fabiola and I will be doing that 12.30 to 2 today upstairs, so maybe we'll see some of you there. Well, with all that said, I am so pleased now to talk about the next part of our program, in which we're going to talk about the many voices who were so influential to the eventual 50 years of the Walt Disney World Resort. These three remarkable individuals I'm about to introduce you to have each been associated with Walt Disney World for more than 50 years, and of course, were great contributors to our story. The first you met yesterday. She began as a hostess at Disneyland, helped unveil Walt Disney World to the public, and rose the ranks to executive of creative development at Walt Disney Imagineering. The second began her Disney career here on the East Coast at the Walt Disney World Preview Center, and would later be the inaugural 1970-1971 Walt Disney World Ambassador before serving other roles at the resort. And the third is an opening day cast member who has gone on to lead Disney parks and resorts all over the world. Among his executive leadership roles, Chief Operating Officer for Disneyland Paris, President of Disneyland Resort, President of the Walt Disney World Resort, and he currently serves as the President of Segment Development and Enrichment for Disney Parks, Experiences and Products, and is the Global Ambassador for the Walt Disney World 50th Anniversary Celebration. Let's give a big Destination D23 welcome to Peggy Ferris, Debbie Dane Brown, and George A. Calogridis. So great to see you, Peggy. Yes, please have a seat. Thank you. Fantastic. 
Well, so great to see all three of you. I am honored to share the stage with each of you because all of you have been associated with the Walt Disney World Resort since before our resort opened. Um, all of you were here on opening day, incredible. And all of you have had roles that are, in my view, very ambassadorial in nature, sharing the magic of this place to an always eager audience. So with that said, I wanna make sure I got this straight. 50 years ago next month, all three of you were actually working at the very same Walt Disney World location, right? Yes. Uh -huh. And where was that? Contemporary Resort Hotel. Right here at the yeah. Contemporary. So if you checked in in 1971, you might have seen all three of our incredible guests here today. So big round of applause again for these incredible leaders and luminaries. Now, I would love to start a discussion with you, Peggy, because yesterday you were sharing a little bit about a remarkable event that happened in 1969 when you were chosen as one of 10 Disneyland hostesses to represent the magic of Walt Disney World at a press event that helped announce the project. So with that said, we have an incredible series of stories in our book that talk about it and some wonderful photography you shared. What was it like having worked at Disneyland for so long, now seeing this vast Florida site for the first time? Well, you know, I, I grew up in Anaheim. Disneyland was, was a wonderful place we visited every year. Um, and I lived in Orange County, California. In my neighborhood, we had a, an orange tree. Everybody in our neighborhood had an orange tree in our backyard. And then we arrived in Orlando. We drove uh, west to Ocoee. And I was just struck by how rural it was, you know? There's, um, if, if we were looking out across the, uh, the surrounding area, it was just filled with orange groves, as far as you could see. And I knew I wasn't in Southern California because the air was warm and humid. And, um, and I think because you could see forever, I felt like the sky was so blue. We had a little bit of a smog problem back in California, so I'd never seen such a big, blue, beautiful sky before. Um, so, and, and in fact, here's a picture of Jane Llewelling looking out from the second floor of the Ramada Inn in Ocoee. And as you can see, I mean, there's a little fruit stand, probably selling oranges right across the, the street from the motel. And, uh, and then you can see a little bit of a, a, a circus tent. And uh, it was filled with uh, an amazing model. There was, it was about 600 square feet, 40 feet across, uh, just representing what the first phase of Walt Disney World would be. And, um, you know, I was very familiar with Disneyland, so seeing the Magic Kingdom and knowing it would be the centerpiece for the phase one was great. But this was also the first entry of, for Disney into actually guests stays so extending that that hospitality and themed environment to the resort hotels was really something very special for us um, and th and the the presentation area was filled with art we had lots of we had uh, models audio animatronic figures Waythel Rogers was there to okay. to animate the figures it was it was really just amazing oh that's so special and um, you also had a film that was screened at the Parkwood Cinema, I believe, not terribly far yeah. away. Yes, right. Uh, so we, we took, we, it was a three-day event, actually, the press coming on the first day, and then uh, leaders of American business who might be interested in participating in the project were invited the second day, and then the Florida legislator came the third day. And we, so the first day we had the press conference in, at the Parkwood Cinema Theater, and then all the attendees boarded buses, and we'd been studying really hard um, to learn this, the um, spiel that Marty Scalar had drafted for us, and we took guests out. But the thing was, we drove for, once we left Pine Hills, we drove for miles through the pine forests and palmetto. And I mean, it really felt like the wilderness. Yeah. Oh, incredible. And Debbie, you sort of grew up amid that wilderness. Um, you grew up in a very small Florida town, Forest City. Mm -hmm. And your story is almost the mirror of Peggy's because you then had to learn what a Disneyland was going to be like. Um, and in the book, you do this remarkable essay you contributed for us. Um, everyone has to get the book just for Debbie's essay. Um, and you tell the great stories of how you first became associated with 
the Walt Disney World Preview Center. I would love if you could tell us a little bit about the Preview Center, what it was like for you, and the many guests who are curious about Walt Disney World. Thank you, Stephen. And I do just want to quick take one second to say good morning, Destination D23 family. We are so grateful that you're here to share this time with Peggy, George, and I, because you can imagine it's been a wonderful weekend and so many memories. We, we have just loved it, and you've made it a lot of fun. So um, thank you for that, for joining us. The, uh, and I am going to have one more aside real quick before I go to the preview center. I drove out to the property for, to interview. This was in a, probably September of 1969, made a quick stop, uh, Johnny's Corner, turned left, got to the interview building, went inside, and at that moment I saw Valerie Watson and Holly Holscher, who were the most beautiful, sophisticated, Disney girls that I ever could have managed. I lived, basically lived in a citrus grove in Forest <laughs> City. These women were wonderful. Talked to them for a few minutes, filled out my application, and at that point, I did not want to leave. I knew right then that I was in love with all things Disney, that I wanted to be a part of the preview center. I wanted to be a Disney girl, as they called us. I wanted one of those 14 positions, and I wanted Walt Disney World. I didn't know what that meant, but I wanted Walt Disney World. Um, so then on to the preview center. Yeah, we even have some great uh, photos here as well that kind of yeah, show so your life there. That's our wonder, our costume. It was the prettiest thing I think I'd ever worn. It was wonderful. It was, uh, our Disney designers designed that red, white, and blue A-frame. The preview center itself was a, and you can go by and see it, but it was a gorgeous building, very clean lines. So I'm going to take you on a quick little tour as if you came first day at the Preview Center. And I'm welcoming you at the front door. So welcome to the Walt Disney World Preview Center. I'd like you to sign the guest book from the name of, from whatever state you're in. Oh, you have residence in two states. Then please sign both books. Then I would invite you into the uh, theater where we would show a film. It was a short film, but so educational, and everybody got a good basic idea of what Walt Disney World was going to be like, because most of us in the eastern United States had not been to Disneyland. I had not been. I did not know anyone that had been. So uh, the, the interest was incredible. And, and uh, so we had our film, and it, in fact, Peggy and I discovered that the model that I had at the preview center the big uh, to scale model was the same one that she had at the press conference that she helped host us uh, six months before. And interesting, I just realized that that model was actually bigger than the apartment I lived in in Orlando <laughs> at the time. Uh, so we, um, we, we took you out of the theater then, down the halls of the preview center. There was remarkable WED artist renderings there, John Hench. Um, and Herbie Ryman, the, the artwork, I had not been exposed to anything like that. I was 18. It was, it was truly a, an experience just to see that. At the end of our tour, you were invited to enjoy a cup of fresh Florida orange juice, and then we had our merchandise area, which, which we had guests actually come just to buy Disney merchandise since we had the best selection. So the previous center was a wonderful way to, to greet over a million guests that were very interested in Walt Disney World. Our job, to wow them and to bring them back. Incredible, incredible. Well, to make that dream of Walt Disney World, all these models that you were showcasing, that, that had to be brought to life by people. And I want to show a photograph here because this was the Walt Disney World Employment Center in June of 1971 it opened, originally welcoming about 1,800 candidates a week, but by opening day would interview some 75,000 people for only 5,500 roles for the opening cast. And George, you were one of those cast members who showed up during these frenzied days of hiring. What was it like? You know, what, what kind of inspired you to, to go to the Employment Center? And um, what was your experience at casting like? So, first of all, you said June. You, you know how hot it is in June. So that looks like an idyllic situation. It was so hot you could not even imagine. And you were standing in a very long line to be able to just get a postcard. 
to be able to get an interview. For me, I had just graduated from high school. I needed a job um, while I was going to work my way through college. I, like Debbie said, I knew they were building Disney World, but I'd never been to Disneyland, so I really didn't understand what it was. And as you know, at that time, you really couldn't see anything from the freeway, so you just, it was a big gamble, so to speak. But I was fortunate to be able to get an interview, and um, as I shared with the group, it was a very scientific process how we were hired and, and cast into roles. You had an interview time, you came into the trailer, you're in a lobby, they'd call the next 10 names for the one o'clock interview. All 10 of you would stand up, you'd walk down a center corridor. There were five offices on either side of the corridor. Unbeknownst to us, one office was hiring for park operations, park foods, hotels, whatever, and literally the luck of the draw, I happened to walk into the office that was hiring for hotels, and that's how my career began. So, but it worked out well, and um, you know, it was from there quickly into traditions, and what was unique for the hotel people, um, I was, hired and then told after traditions the next day to report to a Hilton Inn on International Drive. And it's because Disney had leased a hotel, it's still there today, it's a Rosen Hotel. International Drive, if you can believe it, was a dirt road off of Sand Lake Road. And it was the only thing there, but Disney had leased it for a year to be able to train all of the hotel people and then all of the Disney people who were uh, coming here from California actually lived there in that hotel and so we served them for two or three weeks until we moved here to the contemporary. Incredible so. and so much change in Central Florida during that time and, and since I know. Um, so Peggy I actually want to talk a little bit about so much of that change that was beginning in 1969 when you looked out on that vast construction site. <laughs> what was it like to see this amazing landscape and were there any skeptics, people who thought this mammoth project couldn't be done? Well, you know, the, the presentation at Parkwood was impressive. Marty had written the, the film, the tour of the site. You can just imagine, you, you're traveling through the wilderness and then you come upon this enormous earth moving project, you know, moving four and a half million cubic yards of earth from what would become the Seven Seas Lagoon to the theme park site. So then we could build utilidors essentially on the first level. Um, there, were, there was a balloon flying where the castle would be. If you turned and looked in the other direction across the excavation, the vast excavation, there was a balloon for where the Polynesian would be, and the Contemporary Resort Hotel. It was so monumental. And people, I think, were very impressed with our, we just had this can-do attitude. It was like, of course, Walt Disney had a vision, and then he assembled people who had worked on the original Disneyland, and we know what we're doing. It was very ambitious, though. And so I think our enthusiasm and positivity was really contagious. But I met one very cynical, um, skeptical, I guess, journalist from New York. And he, he, he actually kind of cornered me and said, you know, come on, what's with all the smiling? <laughs> I said, no, really, we, we're, we, this is who we are. And he, he really grilled me for a while. The beautiful part was, two years later, I was back at Walt Disney World because I'd seen this project and said, I want to be a part of this. I was back working in the hotels and, and the press came for the dedication weekend and I recognized him. And I was able to go up to him and greet him by his name because <laughs> I'd remembered him. And I think at that point, he really believed we were the real deal and this <laughs> was really gonna happen. Fantastic, oh my goodness, that joy is so contagious. Well, Debbie, you also led many a site tour on property, especially beginning in 1970 when you were named the very first Walt Disney World ambassador. One of your first tasks, though, was actually to head out to the west coast of all places. Tell us a little bit about how your experiences here at Disneyland would prepare you to be that first ambassador. I had the great fun of flying out in Walt's plane. 
I remember getting on the plane I, my, with my chaperone because at that point you had a chaperone <laughs> that, he, in fact, he was a wonderful uh, ex-Marine sergeant and I called him old craggy face but never to his face. And he, <laughs> his name was Frank Forsythe. I loved him dearly and I was very safe with him. So we flew out and I was sitting in Walt's plane. I, in, I was trying to act cool because the, all the dis executives were in there and very important people. But instead, my body was going, oh my gosh, I'm in Walt Disney's play. Can you believe this? I wish we'd had cell phones back then. I would have been snapping yeah. photos. <laughs> um, landed, Frank took me to the Disneyland Hotel. I had never stayed in such a beautiful hotel. Uh, oh, it was wonderful. And I, I didn't sleep that night. The next morning, Frank came, got me, and we walked into Disneyland. My life, it's kind of like I ended up in Oz. Before Disneyland, everything was black and white and meh. After Disneyland, walking in, life became, I collect kaleidoscopes, a kaleidoscope. It was all the zillion, million colors, all fitting together and changing, and, and emotions. So my Disneyland experience was wonderful, beyond wonderful. I love it. And you even got to lead a tour at Disneyland too, right? Pardon me? You also led a tour at Disneyland, didn't you? Yes, I have got to be a tour guide. Are there any tour guides in here? I can't see, I hope. You anyway. Right here. Oh, um, there we go in the back. I got to wear the plaid. Yes, I see you. I got to wear plaid. Uh, and that was a bit, they, they gave me 48 hours to learn the spiel. I was very anxious, as you can imagine. I took the tour. And I, I hope it was okay. If, if you're in here and I had you on a tour, I'm sorry if it wasn't the best. <laughs> but I did my, I did try. Uh, so that tour was wonderful. But I have to tell you, this experience, because I had not been to Disneyland, and, and I want to tell you, when I interviewed, Val and Holly had me at hello. Sorry, I had to use that. It, it was, I just knew that I had to have Disney. So I'm out there. I go into the tour guide lounge. There's a number of, yeah, the photo, there's a number of tour guides in there, and they're, we're talking, and they're enlightening me, helping me out, and I just noticed how much they loved Walt, how much they projected his dream, how much they wanted to make our guests informed and en enjoy their tour and happy. So, they even, they, they, before we went on tour, we checked our hair, our makeup, our hats, uh, our shoes, but they, they polished their shoes every time before they went out. And I, I just thought that was such a wonderful detail. So um, the thing is, I did learn, because I was fortunate to be on some of the attractions, that every cast member had that big heart for all things Disney, for they, everyone wanted to do their best, make Walt proud. And there was literally, this was in 70, there, there was a, a pulse of Walt. It's like you walked around and it, Disneyland whispered to you, Walt did this, Walt did this. So it, it was amazing. Oh, I love it. Now, George, you know, not every Walt Disney World cast member had an opportunity to go to Disneyland first and feel that sense of Walt everywhere they went. Um, and I love this quote that kind of illustrates this, that you contributed to our book. You wrote, very few of us had ever visited a Disney theme park, let alone operate one. So we worked along the guidelines and training that we were given. And for everything else, we made it up as we went along. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love if you could share a little bit more about that, and maybe an example, perhaps. The things I can share and the things I can't share. Probably, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. So the opening management team, for the most part, both in hotels and in the parks, had all spent the summer at Disneyland with the idea that they would then come and open Walt Disney World. So for the parks operations, actually there was much more knowledge. And because Disneyland had been in, you know, open for many years, they had much experience. But when it came to the hotels, if you think about 1971, so the hotel was started in the late 60s, first of all, there were not hotels like this anywhere in the world, with few exceptions, the Hyatt in San Francisco, the Hyatt in Atlanta, but there just weren't big hotels, so you didn't really have anything to go on. And everything that 
the teams were able to find from sizing of restaurants was all based on those hotels which were convention hotels which did not have families. So as you, you all know the drill, after opening day, the minute this hotel filled up, there was not even close to enough capacity for anybody to eat. And so everybody had to quickly figure out, you know, how do we switch to buffets or how do we make the menu not quite so extensive so we can turn the tables faster. But the fun part was that, you know, everybody was learning at the same time. So you just sort of figured it out and did it. If that worked, okay, we'll keep that until we need to change to something else. So that attitude, uh, because we didn't know any better, actually made us push harder to get to a solution. And, and we wouldn't know it. It seemed like just a, a well-oiled machine the entire time, yeah. so, at least from my perspective. So, Peggy, I actually want to go back now just a little bit, because we've been talking so much about that drive that so much of the cast, it seemed like, was all united in that mission to fulfill Walt's last dream. And there's some photos you shared with us of many of the top <laughs> leaders at Walt Disney Productions at a special event. Tell us about these photos and these people and, and their commitment to seeing Walt's dream through. Well, let me start first with, I started at Disneyland in 1965, and Walt Disney was still walking the park. Oh. And Dick Nunes was in charge of operations, attractions. And, you know, one of the first things you learn is everyone is a VIP, and we're a first-name organization. So, you know, if Walt Disney were to come to my attraction, I would say, good morning, Walt. Um, so I was kind of prepared for, for that camaraderie. Uh, when we spent the two weeks at the Ramada Inn, there were many executives there helping us learn about the project. So there was this real sense of teamwork and we're really all in it together. So we're helping each other. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this went from Card Walker, Don Tatum, Marty Sklar, John Hench, uh, you know, just, P incredible people with enormous responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, going, th working through that two weeks to prepare for the press conference was, was uh, a challenge, but you really felt you were part of a large team. And after the three days, we had a chance to just take a big sigh, and there was a kind of celebratory barbecue at Bay Hill. And so these are pictures of, um, uh, Bob Allen in the red sweater, Valerie Watson, that, whom Debbie has mentioned, in the, in the red hair, and then some of the other uh, hostesses from the press conference. I'm there in the little white babushka. And Admiral <laughs> Joe Fowler is par piloting our flow boat. <laughs> so, <Right as well. laughs> and he was in charge of all construction. And then here's another really sweet picture of Roy and uh, Sharon Bernstein and, and uh, Valerie. And here's Roy just relaxing. Um, he and Edna were there on the lawn with us. And the, I mean, he couldn't have been nicer and more appreciative of the effort that everyone was making mm -hmm. to bring Walt's dream to life. Wow, so incredible. You had that moment, that moment to relax, take a breath, but then it was time to get the place built. And Debbie, you were there watching this castle rise up from the ground. Construction was, um, was as I understand, a little bit hectic in those days. Um, but then eventually, grand opening, you were there for opening day, you were there for grand dedication day with the Disney family. What was that experience like for you? Oh, that was such a beautiful, beautiful time. Uh, again, if I look at, if I think about the whole weekend from Saturday, Sunday, and then to Monday to dedication day, it was just a swirl of deliciousness, it, it, the whole thing. And you would have to have your jammies and we'd have to have a sleepover with, out in the hall to talk about all of this, that all the stories we could tell. It, it was uh, electricity in the air, the guests, they were ecstatic as we were. And, and, and again, you, the guest, and the cast members, you love all things Disney, we love all things Disney, we want you to have the best experience and fun because we do the same thing when we come with our families. So dedication day was my favorite day, my favorite day. I had the opportunity and the great honor, which was not lost on me, to meet Miss Lillian backstage, 
uh, behind City Hall and get in one of the Main Street electric cars to take her uh, down Main Street. It was interesting because some of our guests were like, oh, there's Miss Lillian Disney. Well, they didn't say, I say Miss, um, Southern thing. They, uh, some, and then some people didn't know who this amazing, beautiful woman was riding with me. She was Walt's love and partner. She named Mickey Mouse for Pete's sake. You know, it was like, <laughs> she, was, she was a star. So uh, we got to the town square, and I know Peggy was there. We got out of the car and got her to her seat. Oh, I missed one thing I want to really get to share with you. And that is when she sat in the car, we're backstage behind City Hall, sitting in the car. She sat down and she went like this, a huge sigh. And all I could imagine was what she was thinking that, that, uh, that emotional sigh when, you know, thinking about Walt and here they are, dedication day. So uh, she got to her seat and actually I, I started to, I, I touched her hand while we were in the car and she smiled and we had a little chit chat. We, we got to her seat and I, she didn't, but I started to have tears in my eyes. It was so emotional for me. I, she was seated, I turned around. I was glad I didn't have far to go to my seat. So that was a special moment for me. Oh, price Lovely is lady. Nice. Well, George, on Grand Dedication Day, I heard you were here as a busboy at the Contemporary, um, but obviously you would rise the ranks into many executive leadership roles across the company. One very important question for you. Did you ever wear Dick Nunes's Bermuda shorts option? <laughs> yes. <laughs> One day. So the, uh, we all talked about it because, you know, when Dick told you that you should do it, it wasn't really an option. So we thought, what would be the safest day? So I was the GM at the Grand Floridian at the time. And so we chose the 4th of July holiday. That we thought that would at least be potentially, that would theme. And uh, we did it. Uh, we were incorrect in the theming and incorrect in just about everything else. But to be honest, as you all know, it is hot here in Florida in the summer. and. It was a good idea, it's just, I'm not sure we uh, were quite ready for it. Dick was ahead of all of us, from a fashion <laughs> sense. There we go. Now, one question actually involves this project right here, which I know is very dear to your heart, among many of the projects you've worked on. Tell us a little bit about why Millennium Village is so special to you. I think when you uh, think about Walt Disney World and you listen to the video of Walt talking about his vision and then you hear Dick and Marty talk about Epcot, the ability to bring people together from all over the world and have them live and work together so that hopefully they could in fact uh, in their adult lives help one another and make a better world. It, Epcot I think has always you know, that's, that's been Epcot. But the Millennium Village was a special moment in time where we could add 50 more countries. And um, that group of 600, they came in uh, two waves of 300. Still today, um, they stay in touch. They've had a reunion every five years. And I've been to every one of them. I follow, I'm part of the WhatsApp group. And um, when you see what they have become, as a group of young people to leaders in their countries, uh, elected officials, the, if you recall, and I know many of you do, there was an exhibit from Eritrea, which was the smallest. We had three cast members, and this one cast member, it was a coffee ceremony, and you sat on the floor, and it was an individual, amazing experience. This lady it represents Eritrea in the United Nations now. So anyway, it, it's come full circle and it's one, I'm proud of everything, but this one has a special place. Oh, I love it. Making a mark on the Disney legacy makes a mark on the world at large. And George, we were just so delighted that you were recently honored with your own window on Main Street USA. Congratulations. And I can't imagine what it's like for each of you to look back across 50 magical years of this place. And we thank you so much for your time this morning. Everyone, please give a big round of applause again to George, Debbie, and Peggy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peggy.
so much. I love you. Thank you, George. All right, now, right before our next segment, I just have to say that our book and this presentation today would not be possible without the amazing contributions of so many teams throughout the company, the ones that you see listed here on the screen and our incredible colleagues at Disney Editions, including Lindsay Broderick, Jen Eastwood, Lissa Hurwitz, Wendy Lefkon, and Monica Vasquez. Thank you all. And now, before, uh, for our final segment of our Dawn of the Disney World program, I would like to turn the stage over to two remarkably insightful people. The first has dedicated her career to preserving and sharing the history of this incredible company, making her a priceless treasure for Disney cast members and fans alike. She's my former boss and a dear friend, and she'll be interviewing a gentleman whose Disney career predates Walt Disney World, having been hired at Disneyland in 1955. He rose through roles in the park's operations, worked as an attraction supervisor, and in 1961 helped develop Project X, which we know as Walt Disney World. By the time Walt Disney World opened in 1971, he was executive vice president, and in 1999, exactly 40 years to the day since joining the company, he retired as chairman of Walt Disney Attractions. Please welcome Walt Disney Archives director, Becky Klein, and Disney legend, Dick Nunes. Go! Gotcha! <clears throat> wow! Yo! <laughs> what an honor it is to be here this morning with you, Dick. That's I'm, great. I'm so excited about this, I could hardly sleep last night. So, uh, just wanted to share uh, this lovely gentleman with you and all of his past history. It's, it's just insane how, how much he had to do with why we're here today. Um, I first met you, Dick, in, uh, by telephone in 2014. Uh, Dick was being honored by uh, the Capital One All-America Academic Hall of Fame and reached out to me and we were able to help him with some footage and some photos and things to, to celebrate that honor. And so that was my first opportunity to chat with you. Mm. And uh, I think we connected pretty well. You told me some great stories. And one of the, uh, the most interesting things I found out, I didn't realize that you were such a, a, a great football player in your earlier years and in college. You went to USC yes. and uh, played football there. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that? Well, I, obviously, I, I hadn't come from a very wealthy family, so I needed a scholarship. I played football at Manual Arts High School. And uh, I got a scholarship to uh, Stanford right away, but I really wanted to go to USC. So um, I finally got a full scholarship to USC, and uh, I really loved uh, playing there, and I loved uh, graduating from that school, and it was a great, a great time in my life. Wonderful. And uh, you had a, a, a co, uh, you had a friend there, a gentleman who knew Walt Disney pretty well, correct? Ron Miller. <laughs> now, by the way, he didn't get my damn job. <laughs> But I did know about uh, Disneyland, so I applied for the job and uh, obviously got, got uh, hired, and uh, the rest is history. And you, you worked for Van France when you were there? Van France? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Van's the guy that hired me. Great. And uh, my understanding was you were being paid about $1.80 an hour, right? A buck eighty an hour. <laughs> By the way, I made more, time, more money than my boss because I got overtime. <laughs> And uh, I heard a story about some blue suede shoes that had something to do with your career? Uh, yes, I had, uh, I was, uh, I, actually what, what happened is I went downtown for, I was doing a double load of directed teaching and, and, a couple of, and a couple of coaches died. So my teacher said, Nunes, go down and get an emergency credential and apply for one of those jobs. So I went downtown to the city and went in with my blue suede shoes on and I'm well-dressed and the guy said, sit down and about half an hour later, he was still chewing me out as, who do I think I am that I didn't need directed teaching? <laughs> so I finally got up and I said, well, sir, and I shut, took my hand out. And there's two ways to shake. One is the, the way you shake, the thumb shake, and the other one is the finger shake. So I gave him the finger shake. <laughs> and he said, you know, you're hurting me. I said, I know, if you shut up for a minute, it won't hurt as much. <laughs> And I said, if you're the type of person I'm going to have to deal with in the L.A. City school system, you couldn't pay me enough to hire me. 
So then I walked out the door, I thought, that was pretty stupid. <laughs> and then I saw this thing in, uh, in the newspaper, orientation training instructor, um, college degree required, master's degree preferred. I was six years away from my master's. So I decided to do apply for the application and sat down with a guy named Van France and uh, we got along great and he hired me. So. <laughs> and the rest, as they say, the is history. The rest is indeed history. So you, soon after that, you worked your way up to attraction supervisor. And uh, by 1961, you were named director of park operations at Disneyland. So I would imagine that put you in very close proximity to, uh, as Floyd, Nor F Floyd uh, Norman always calls him, the old maestro, but uh, very close proximity to Mr. Walt Disney. Well, fortunately, I was the, a young guy at the right place at the right time. And I guess Walt took a liking to me because he would walk through the park and, uh, uh, and I asked me to go with him. And uh, I'll never forget one time though that he said, uh, uh, and I'd, I'd climb the ladder by, by the way. By the way, for 12 years, I was never old enough for my job. I mean, I was always promoted. So, and I think Walt had something to do with that. But uh, one time, I, um, Walt complimented an apartment. He said, Dick, he says, he's very complimentary. He says, is there anything I can do for you? And I thought real quickly, well, well, yes, sir, there is one thing. I said, you know, we don't allow our people to smoke from the break area to the attraction or the attraction to the break area. And every time I reprimand somebody, they say, well, Walt smokes in the park. And he said, well, Dick, I'm Walt Disney. I said, sure, yeah, you told me. Is there anything you could do for me? <laughs> but this is the kind of guy Walt was. And, and he said, uh, I said, yes, sir. And I said, I, so I, it would help me a lot if you wouldn't smoke in the park and wait till we get up in your apartment. <laughs> well, you know something after that? He never smoked in the park again on a walk through the maze. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one, one thing in life that I'd like to share with all of you is that, you know, nobody's perfect. And I've always practiced one basic philosophy. Do the best job you can with the job you're given to do. Those who look over the hill never climb the mountain. And when I got to a point where I had some influence, I ranked our people ones, unlimited potential, twos, potentials, threes, rocket Gibraltars. And by the way, most corporations don't understand you need more of those than anybody because they give you eight hours pay for eight hours work and they're not politicking to be a, any further. And the Fours are the ones you should fire. <laughs> okay. I'll remember that. I'll explain that to the archive staff when I get back. Uh, they need it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let them figure out their own numbers. Um, <laughs> well, have you ever called the archive staff? God, they're a bunch of idiots. Oh my goodness, they're Sorry listening about right that. now. <laughs> well, let's let's move back I, to one time. I'm you only got... kidding. <laughs> let's move back to one time you got in trouble, Mr. Which, which one was that? That was when you took uh, when Walt Disney went on a Jungle Cruise ride. Oh yes. Uh, Walt would come down. He'd park in the back, and he'd he'd always go on the Jungle Cruise first. So I'm in Frontierland. I think I was supervisor of Frontierland eventually in those days. And so I get a call that Walt wants to see us. So we had a tower over the Jungle Cruise, so he's up in the tower. So I run like crazy and run up the stairs and cut him out of breath. And he said, sit down. What's the trip time on a Jungle Cruise? I said, well, sir, seven and a half minutes. He says, I just got a three or four minute trip. I went through the hippos so fast, I couldn't tell whether they were rhinos or hippos walking on water. <laughs> so I, I said, well, yes, sir, okay. Uh, can I, if, can I, if you got a minute? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, we, we're not that busy today, sir. I'd like to get on a boat with you. You be the skipper, and you tell me how you want it, sir, and that's the way it'll be. So he said, well, Dick, yeah, sure, okay. So he gets on. He says, you know, people like to go fast, and they like to go slow, so you've got to play to the show. So what I did, I, I, I created a clock. I think it's still on the boats where, where it tells the, the operator where they are in each segment. So they know they're behind or ahead. And uh, I didn't get fired. <laughs> you went from a three to a two at that point, right? Yeah. Uh, I prefer one. Oh, okay, good. 
Well, you had a long career ahead of you. Um, long career. And part of that was going over, coming over here to the East Coast, and uh, we, they gave you a major role to play when Disney came to the 1964-65 New York World's Fair. So can you uh, tell us why, as a company, we actually did that? Why did we participate? Well, Walt uh, decided to do the four shows of the World's Fair because back in those days, most of our tenants at Disneyland came from west of the Mississippi. So he decided that he could t take other people's money and build attractions in the New York World's Fair and then bring them back to Disneyland. So he's walking to the park. He says, Dick, he says, I've decided to do four shows of the World's Fair. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I think we ought to oper operate one of them. And I said, oh, my gosh. Where am I going to get a Snow White without a New York accent? <laughs> so anyway, so we, he says, which one do you want to operate? I said, well, I, a small world story. He says, well, why? I said, well, uh, theaters are easy to load and unload. Boats aren't. So I'll, the boat ride, I'll take the boat ride. So that's what I did. And uh, by the way, huge success. All four shows came back to Disneyland, and they've been uh, successful ever since. Yep, and you can go over to the Magic Kingdom and ride Carousel of Progress today. Uh, now, so it sounds like the World's Fair gave you a, a, a much needed confidence boost and uh, proceeded with plans for Disneyland East, but that was really an enormous project and as Stephen, or as Stephen has told us earlier today, uh, they, they called it Project X and there was a lot of secrecy around it. I know you were involved in oh, that, that oh, secrecy. Very, and, very much, and very much. Worked with Bob Foster and everybody else to, to acquire the land. Can you want to tell us a little bit about how you kept it under wraps for so long? Well, first of all, all of us that were involved, uh, we uh, used our names, obviously, because you had to have a license and all that stuff, but we picked a fictitious company. So I worked for Continental Can Company. And it, was a can, it was a company right here in, in Orlando. And so I, I, I always check into the Gold Key Inn, and uh, the first time I checked in after it had been announced, the project had been announced, I put down Disney. And the guy says, oh, Mr. Nunes, because Continental Canada went out of business, and so you already got a new job. I says, yeah, I got lucky. <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> And I remember you telling me also that uh, one time Walt had a conversation with you and explained the, the vast nature of Walt Disney World and uh, said something about what it would be like standing on top of the Matterhorn, how far could you see, uh, that you could see so far that you could see SeaWorld and, and Knott's Berry Farm and everything else. Yeah, well, what, what thing he loved about Walt Disney World, we had so much land, he said, just think, Dick, we, we own almost 10,000 acres we can have our own Knox Berry Farm, our own Disneyland, our own Knox Berry Farm, our own SeaWorld, and a couple of cities to boot. And young man, if we're smart, we'll own most of it. <laughs> well, that's what we did. And it's obviously been very successful. Absolutely. He was quite the visionary, and I know it was probably devastating and very sad for everyone, but especially with you when he passed away, you knew him so well. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, well, I was actually, I lived in Laguna Beach and uh, Disney, I was in Anaheim, and it was about, you know, a 30 or 40 minute drive. So I'm on the freeway, the Santa Ana freeway, and I hear over the radio that Walt Disney just died. And I, frankly, I pulled over and had a little cry, and then I decided, gosh, I gotta get to work. And I, I decided, Walt would say the show goes on. So all the staff said, are we gonna open? I said, yes, we're gonna open. So then I called Card Walker. I said, Card, I said, I, I, I think we should open. And, I, and that's what we plan to do. And he said, let me get right back to you. So he called Lily Disney and uh, he called me back. And he said, yeah, Lily said, that's what Walt wants you to do. And then I got a call from Lily. She was a great lady. He said, Dick, you did exactly what Walt would want. The show goes on. That was Walt Disney. That's wonderful. By the way, I went, all, I went around the entire day and talked to all of our staff because they were madder than hell at me because <laughs> they thought we should close. Mm. So I told them that story and that, then it kind of smoothed things over. That's good. Well, and now it was up to, to all of them and all of you to carry the torch and move forward on what's clearly going to be the company's you know, most enormous undertaking ever. And you, what was your first reaction when you saw this vast 27,000 acre plot? Well, I was very involved in picking the site. We narrowed it down to two sites, one in the state of Illinois and Florida. And I was strongly in favor of Florida. So, um, and in fact, I'll never forget when we finally decided to do it, 
and I was kind of very involved with it. And we were on the plane, company plane going back, and I'm up at front, and the, the top execs are in the back of the plane, and, and the stewardess said, Roy wants to see you. And so I, I went back, and it was cr bumpy as the devil, so I was hanging on, and, and he said, uh, are we gonna be able to open on October 1st? And I didn't even hesitate. I said, we're, well, sir, under the present circumstances, no. And boy, Card Walker, Don Tatum, Ron Miller, all of them climbed me all over. He said, wait a minute, let Roy, let Roy said, let him finish. I said, look, we, we, we're hiring great people in Florida, but in Florida, they don't even know what balsa wood is. So we need more people from the studio and Disneyland come to Florida to help us train people. And then, then they'll get the job done, but we need people to train them. So Roy turned to Card and says, you give Dick what he needs. Well, after that, I had no problem with getting Nunes' Raiders. <laughs> so we had a, had a great team, and uh, they really did a great job and spent a lot of time and effort making it happen. And huh, thank goodness it's been a real success. That's right. So um, about those, that, those opening weeks leading up, uh, one of your fellow Disney legends and, and a friend, Jack Lindquist, oh, sure. once said, uh, I'll have to get this right, one of the few joys of being around here with Nunes during the construction days was his famous walkthroughs, <laughs> and they've made several movies out of that. The one that comes to my mind most is Bridge on the River Kwai. <laughs> it was a lot like the Pan Death March. <laughs> So tell me, is that accurate? Uh, is that uh, what Jack happened? Jack Lindquist was the greatest marketing guy you could ever have in any company <laughs> anywhere. And he was a super guy to work with and I enjoyed it, enjoyed it very much. And I understand that your, your meetings with him and your other execs here in Florida, got, the meetings got earlier and earlier. Well, I had early morning meetings. So one, one morning I came in and they were all in pajamas. And we found a photo of that. By the way, early morning meetings, I'm talking about six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and well, you were up really late the night before, I understand, here at the Contemporary when it was about to open. Uh, you oh yeah. Want to hear that story? There was quite a rallying cry came out of that one. Well, the Contemporary was a great hotel, and, but uh, I, and I, I go up and I get on top and look down and it's all dirt. And I says, gosh, I told the staff, I said, look, well, we gotta get this sodded. He said, well, Dick, we don't have any sod. I said, I'll get the damn sod. So we started laying sod in the afternoon, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, I was on the two-way radio. In those days, they weighed two pounds or about this big. And I, and I said, anybody that's still awake and, and, and working, don't go home. Come over. We're laying sod. <laughs> so a young guy came, comes over, a nice young man, and he says, well, Mr. Nunes, I've never laid sod. I said, son, real simple. Green side up. So that was the fight song till daybreak. <laughs> we got all the sod laid and it was a great opening. It sure was. So it's cast members like that that, that came over at 3 a.m. to help lay sod and, and all the folks that you work with that are, are really the, truly the ingredient to the excess, success of Disney. And, and as Debbie and Peggy and George were saying earlier, it's, it's all about the attitude and, and the teamwork that, that made it happen and keeps making it happen today. So I um, want to fast forward a little bit to, to 1990 when you were chairman of uh, Walt Disney Attractions. Let me get me one statement there. Walt told me one time, he said, Dick, you know, you can design, create, and build the most wonderful place in the world, but it takes people to make the dream a reality. So we've got to really worry about our staff and always encourage them to do the best job they can. Absolutely. And that's what we did. <clears throat> and. Um, and they had to learn how to speak to the guests, and they learned how to present Disney, and they learned how to look right when they were on stage. And um, they mentioned it, George mentioned it a little bit earlier, there's, there's something that you put into effect at the uh, opening of the Yacht and Beach Club, I understand. There was a Disney look summer option uh, where they wore Bermuda shorts. <laughs> well, actually, my wife and I went to Bermuda and, and I saw all these gentlemen in coats and ties and Bermuda shorts. And I said, God, that's a great idea. <laughs> so I bought a lot of Bermuda shorts and came back and started wearing Bermuda shorts and tried to encourage our staff to wear Bermuda shorts. <laughs> and by the way, the, the ladies liked it. 
but the thing that killed me, my top operating guy, Bob Matheson, who his legs had never seen the sun. <laughs> so he wouldn't wear Bermuda shorts, and I had to give up the idea. But I actually, I went to the Citrus Club, and I was dressed in a coat and tie and Bermuda shorts. And the manager comes over and says, Mr. News, you can't have dinner here. I, what do you mean? You're not, well, you're not dressed appropriately. I say, well, show me the book. So he brings me the book, and I turn the thing, and I says, well, it says, coat and tie. It doesn't anything about Bermuda shorts. <laughs> so now we all know what he was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, let's, let's move forward a little farther. Over the years, you've had some very prestigious roles uh, here at the Walt Disney Company, from chairman of Walt Disney Attractions to being a member of the board of directors. And uh, one of your favorite roles, though, you, that you always said was being Walt's apprentice. Yes. I love that. Well, I'll tell you, very honest, I was really a lucky guy at the right place at the right time. And when Walt would come down, we'd always walk through the park. And I think, frankly, for 12 years, I was never old enough for my job. And damn it, I finally arrived. <laughs> but Walt was a great man, and I really enjoyed carrying on the great traditions and philosophies that he created, because he was truly a wonderful, wonderful man, and really cared about people. Well, wow. that says it all. And on May 26th, 1999, exactly 44 years to the day since you joined the Disney Company, you retired. And that same year, Dick was made a Disney legend. And uh, we're just so honored it, to, to know that in those 44 years, you oversaw the openings, not only of Walt Disney World here, but of Epcot and Disney MGM and Disney's Animal Kingdom. You were the guy. And, and France and Tokyo. And, and Disneyland Paris and Tokyo Disneyland. <laughs> it, it's uh, quite an amazing career. And um, I think that, that's testament to, to Walt's expression of, of saying that it's a team, it's the, it's the team that makes the dream a reality. And uh, being part of that team and being part of that right. team today is such an honor for all of us. So I just want to say that, that I'm so honored to have had this opportunity to chat with you and to share your insights with D23 and, and the, these lovely folks at Destination D23. Uh, and I want to, to tell you all that if you want to hear more about Dick's uh, career and stories, uh, check out the Portrait of Walt Disney World. He did a, a lovely spread up there. And today, I want to make an announcement. We're very pleased to announce that you'll also have a chance to learn even more about Dick's incredible Disney story when his new book, Walt's Apprentice, is released by Disney Editions next year. Well, thank you for the commercial. You're welcome. I'm really No, I've, um, I've I decided to write a book, and I'll tell you why. Young people today really don't learn in school how to be successful in life. Because it, they, they really don't. Because they, they, forget about, they forget about one thing, you know? Uh, they all try to criticize other people to get promoted. And boy, all you have to do is do the best job you can with the job you're given to do. Those who look over the hill never climb the mountain. That's what I did, and if young people want to be successful, that's what they should do. Absolutely. Well, with those words, I want to thank you so much, and uh, thank you for being here and sharing this with Well, us. thank you, guys. Been a lot of fun. Hello. Those are deep seats. Let me give you a hand. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. I think they want to take a picture. Oh, okay. Why don't we stay here for 